Okay, well, we're back in business here. Let's see. Well, believe it or not, we're actually on schedule. <clears throat> Five thirty-four now, and uh, I was supposed to start at 5.30, so we're doing okay. All right, <clears throat> now we get down to the fun part. <clears throat> I've been giving you the foundation. Hopefully, you guys will remember what I said. And, uh, but before I start, Ron, would you like to have three minutes? Hey, no, come up here on the in front of the camera. We're gonna we're gonna uh, convict you later on what you say. Let me tell you something, folks. When you hear it from me, you ain't never gonna hear it for a long time to come. What I've got to tell you is gonna take you probably ten years. Let me tell you what, Roger. You all know the name Roger. I'm sure you might have heard of him. 1999, you can't be too clue. He didn't realize what an impact it would have on me, but he said, one of our conversations, you've never heard the truth in your life. I thought, boy, that was kind of bold. I'm one of the brightest men I know. So then later he told me, that which you believe in the most will hurt you the most. Let me tell you what. I was a pie in the sky selling God right and left. And then one day, I decided to look up in Strong's Concordance. I'm sure some of you have Strong's Concordance. But it has the definitions of the Greek text where these words are being used. Well, I look up the word God, and what the hell do you think it is? A magistrate. I said, holy crap. That's why people have to stand up when that SOB walks into the courtroom. So, that was one of the things that kind of hurt. So, over the years, I had gone to a swap meet and I picked up a dictionary. I, I have it here on the front page. It's a New Webster's American Dictionary. And on page 1113 is the word violence. And here's the definition. Great force, fury, and vehemence. Semicolon. Or was that a colon? What is that? Unwarranted change of words or meaning in a text. So along with about, now you've got to understand, I got started in this movement in 1973 and I didn't even know America never existed. So, uh, but it took me, after I got that little invitation from Roger, not to be hurt by that which I believed in the most, and finally beginning to understand that I'd never heard the truth in my life, I began to wonder where in the hell did my understanding of what I thought was the truth begin. It started with the text. It started with the meanings of words. Let me kind of give you an example of how the meanings of words when I was in the federal courts. And they said, Ron, you're a Christian. Don't you believe in rendering to Caesar? I said, well, I don't have a problem with that. Bring your Caesar in, let him tell me what I have that belongs to him, I'll give it back and we can all go home. Little did I know there was three IRS agents sitting down there. They just changed the spelling. Same goddamn Caesar. But I didn't know that then. So then, I had another tremendous experience. How many of you, and please humor me and raise your hand, if you have ever been in any kind of governmental office, I don't care if it was the post office, the court, oh, it looks like you've all been there. Great. What the hell were they governing? 
the mental. When you understand that every time you look at the word meant, governed meant, mind control, caught a meant, they stood, depart meant, we just destroyed him again. You start concentrating on the mint, you'll start getting a little bit closer. Now, having this little dictionary definition wasn't enough. So around 1999, I saw some information in American Bulletin, and I sent for it. A guy named Stephen Ames. He sent me a little $20 packet, and I'm reading through it. Lo and behold, I come across the stationer's company. For those of you that have the definition there in front of you, you ought to take a look at it. A body formed in 1557 in good old London of 97 London stationers and their successors to whom was entrusted in the first instance and under orders in council the censorship of the press. You know what that is? That's the text. Every text that you have ever read has been controlled. I know people said, oh, they've been brainwashing us. Let me tell you about brainwashing. It's only necessary when they put something of value in. Then they'd have to brainwash you to get it out. These text manipulators have done such a fantastic job on you, we don't have to brainwash you because there ain't nothing there. Took me, after Rogers in, invited me to understand I'd never heard the truth, it only took nine years before his instruction began to sink in. Today, you're looking at the most dynamic definition of two important phrases and I hope you never think the same again. I can tell you what, it turned my life around. I used to be a preacher. I no longer believe in God, but I'll tell you what, the controllers of the text started thousands of years ago, and they are called, in my mind, the God-makers. That's who I believe in. I know because most of us Western civilization people, when we were in downtown Rome or Jerusalem, buddy, and we walked by the statue of Mars or Venus, we were on our knees because the God maker said, that's what's going for the day, dummy. Now, you got to I think that seems to be about enough. Well, you can say a little more. I'm just saying, well, you've used anyway, four, four and a half of the three Just minutes. so we get... The London Stationers, I took this out of the next page. I take my orders from England, declared the federal judge, okay? I have late, lately discovered that we're a conquered nation, and like you, I'm a British subject, whether I like it or lump it. Then I have another little section in here. It's called the Poli. You know, buddy, Generally, I heard about this in about 1980. A guy came to my house and told me this little story about Aristotle <coughs> developing this poli system. Now, what is that? Well, he went to the king and he said, because he was in a little bit of trouble, he had to do something outstanding. So he said, you know, you're the center of the universe. We call you the poli. And to keep the heat off of you, we developed these politicians. See, politician, and the politician will be, he, he develops the poli C. And then we have the police, P O L poli East. They enforce the policy. Now, Aristotle was born in 322 BC. I think that right after this became known, the church, the God-makers said, man, that's good stuff. So then some time passes, 
we have a guy that they identified as Jesus came on the scene and he said, this stuff sucks, fellas. He identified them for what they were. I encourage you all to go back and rewatch the uh, Passion of the Christ, Mel Gibson's version. I want you to pay attention to who got crucified. Most people think it was Jesus. But when you look at the Pharisees getting their throat cut, you'll know who got crucified. Okay? Well, anyway, so I left a little bit of that story behind that poll eye session because, you know, not everybody clearly understands we can continue now. that we uh, have never as Americans ever even had an American government, an American constitution. And by the way, government, I never want one again. They've had control of my mind too long. Thanks. <coughs> then. Yeah, we're, we're kind of overrunning on time here. We're running over time. Okay. Yeah. Little thing, on, little blurb on the, on the Masons. Just about five inches of that left-hand paragraph, top of the page. Mm -hmm. It's all you got to read. You're going to find out Pope up until 1801, something like that, picked the heads of the Masonic orders. You're going to find out in 1826 and 27, the Mason. <laughs> Ron Boggs has been a, a big supporter of what we do. We often diverge on how we perceive things, but Ron has always been a great guy. He supported people with money as well as with time and location. For years he maintained an office where we could meet and, and had a little place where we could talk and so forth. He has quite a history of supporting us. So, not yet. So um, basically that's whenever he shows up, I uh, let him have his few seconds of fame as well. No, we never know which way it's gonna go, do we? No, we never do, but that's okay. So anyway, we'll continue on now with, with our mainstream thoughts here. <clears throat> okay. I'm gonna make myself look beautiful in front of the camera. All right. <clears throat> Show me the law. <clears throat> Let's see if I can uh, find it. Take me a moment to home in on it, I think. Oh, here we go. It's coming up. This is the copy of um, the indictment against Sherry Jackson. Okay. Now, well, actually, not a, it's not an indictment. It's an information. <clears throat> Everybody know the difference between an information and an indictment? No. Okay. An indictment is when the, the uh, district attorney goes to the grand jury, and, and the grand jury looks it over, and if they think that the person should be prosecuted, they then indict the person. Yeah, basically, right, bring charges in plain English, but they call it an indictment. If the, if the prosecutor does not go to the grand jury, the alternative procedure is that he puts together what's called an information. It's basically an affidavit, in other words, a statement under oath, under penalty of perjury. 
and he takes that to a judge, a, actually to a magistrate, okay? And the magistrate kind of functions like a grand jury, and he decides whether or not the prosecutor can proceed. And so that's what an information is. So in this case, they prosecuted her based on information rather than based on grand jury indictment. Now, <clears throat> remember this important concept. A, the sovereign establishes the court. The plaintiff. When you, when you, if you're the plaintiff, you determine what form you want to go in. You determine what the laws are and so forth that you're going to prosecute under, whether it's civil or whatever. The, uh, the IRS is assuming the posture of a sovereign. They are opening up their court and they're bringing their charges. Now, after everything I've told you, you know that they cannot be sovereign relative to the people. They are sovereign relative to the citizens, right? Is that clear? The people own the government and the government owns the citizens. So the IRS is taking the position when they, when they file their claims, they're taking the position that they are sovereign and they're treating the defendant as if he were a citizen. They don't stop to ask, are you one of the people or one of the citizens? They just roll on forward and assume you're a citizen. So look what it says in this indictment, or I mean in this information. First is, this is basically this first page is a notice or it's a summon. You are hereby summoned. So that's the first page. <coughs> you go to the second page and notice what it says. This is count one. On or before April 16, 2001, in the Northern District of Georgia, the defendant, Sherry Peel Jackson, <clears throat> who is required by Title 26 United States Code and by regulations made under the authority thereof to make a federal income tax return for the calendar year 2000. Right there is the declaration of the law by the sovereign, the decree. Right? Do you all see that? Who, who is the plaintiff in this case? The IRS. Sherry's a defendant. The IRS is the plaintiff. Who's the sovereign of the court? The IRS, right. That's the position that they've adopted. You've learned your lesson well. Okay? So now the sovereign has spoken. The, the sovereign says, you're required to file. That is the decree of the law. See, it looks like, you know, the, to the person who's not made aware of this, it looks like, okay, they made their statement as required, okay, and you're going to defend against it and so forth. No, this is the law decreed by the sovereign. Okay? And having had and received gross income in excess of 12950 the minimum filing requirement for calendar year, see, that's another declaration of law. That's the minimum filing requirement. Specifically stating the items of her gross income and any deductions and credits, and he's calling it income. That's also a decree. He's saying, what is? This is not, shall we investigate? This is, this is what is. See, it's a very affirmative statement. And it goes on to say what her violation of that law was. She violated she willfully failed to make such return at the time required by such law and such regulations. That is, on or before April 16th in violation of Title 26, United States Code, Section 7203. So first they decree the law, and then they say that she violated that law, and that this is supported by another law that they're also decreeing. See, one of the things you, you got to really perceive here is that I can say that that black car is white, 
Okay? I can say that black car is white if I'm the plaintiff. And if the court says the black car is white, then it's white. Okay? That's the law. Now, a person looking at it say, well, how did he ever come to a conclusion like that? Doesn't matter how he did. The point is, the court came to, had a consideration, considered it, and came to this conclusion. Right or wrong, there it is. Now, some people, sometimes it gets so gross, you appeal it, and, and the appellate court will admit that there was a violation of, uh, that, that there was a violation of discretion on the part of the judge and so forth. But that's when it becomes you know, politically infeasible. What are you saying? Oh, you're blocking the camera, Mary, behind you. Let's see. Okay, now. I think you're still blocking it. I can't hear you down there. Okay, no. you, I'm getting an echo. Fine. I'll, I'll sit over there. No, you're fine where, no, you you're fine where you are, they said. Yeah, when you stood up. Okay. So, anyway, I mean, is everybody in tune with me, what I'm saying here? The IRS is assuming the posture of sovereign, and then they are decreeing what the law is, and then they're saying, here's how the law got violated. Okay? Now, look at Sim Cannon's case. Sim Cannon was very, very similar. I don't have his paper here, but here's what they did. They went through the whole process, defense and all that sort of stuff, got to the jury. The jury sent a note to the judge asking, did they have to go through all 700 pages of information to find the law, or could the judge provide them the law? The judge wrote a, letter, a note back to the jury, and he said, I have already made a determination that the law requires him to file. The, ju the, the jury only has to determine whether or not he filed. Okay? So, and in the trial, Sim Cannon always admitted that he didn't file. So it was a slam dunk for the jury to decide. And the judge didn't lie. The, the <coughs> indictment came in. The IRS, I'm sure, decreed the law just in the same style that you see for Sherry. And so, then they came through and they, and, uh, they prosecuted, right? They said he violated and they prosecuted, and this is where they ended up. Okay. So, that's the law. It didn't exist until the moment of accusation, but the sovereign said so. And the judge knows this, but the judge is not going to fight the sovereign, right? It's not his job. Even if he sees it's wrong, it's not his job. Okay? So that's how it's done. And Sherry did no counterclaim. Correct. Okay? Now, look at count two. Not much to look at, actually. Yeah. Same deal. Required by Title 26 United States Code. They don't even cite the code. He just says they're required. Well, it's true until proven otherwise. And then who has the discretion? And the way they worked it out, you know, <laughs> she lost. All right? Who wrote Required this? by... Uh, th who wrote this brief? This is not a brief. This is the information against okay. it. This is, this is the... Who wrote it? The, the uh, United States Attorney wrote it. Okay? But you, do you see the, the mechanics of it is the sovereign opens up his case, chooses his court, chooses his forum in the court, decrees the law, then says the law was violated, and then the jury, not understanding all of this, the jury thinks it's got to decide the facts. Did he or did he not, or did she or not do whatever they say is required? And of course they always say he didn't because they, the defendant always admits that they didn't file. That's not the question in the defendant's mind. And then the defendant says, show me the law. 
right? Where's the law? But they're looking over at the codes. It's not there. Never was there. And the judge sits there and he sees the law, but he doesn't take sides. He, he remains mute, says nothing. Does everybody genuinely see this, how it's working? Slam dunk. Slam dunk. Yeah, that's why they're getting so many convictions. Well, that's, how did Tommy Cryer win? Yes. So uh, what should have happened in order to invoke common law at the time this... Counterclaim. Sue back. I'm the sovereign and you're the agent. You are exceeding your authority. You bring back your own dec decreeing of law. Instantly. At the very beginning. Yes, instantly. Do not wait. Come right back. Punch back. Well, there's a maxim. There's a maxim, okay? Legal maxim. The law does not protect he who slumbers on his rights. And ignorance of the law is considered equal to slumbering. Okay? If you haven't taken the time to learn about the law, learn your rights, learn the system, and I'm not blaming you, I'm just saying, you know, because the educational system is all set up to encourage you to not know what your rights are, all right? To not understand the system. And so we know where to put the blame for the training, but the fact is, is the courts operate as if you were sovereign, and because you're sovereign, you are fully responsible, and if you're ignorant, well, that's too bad. Well, this continues on, okay? And you see the pattern. Seen one count, you've seen them all, okay? Count three, required by Title 26 United States Code and by regulations made under the authority thereof to make a federal income tax return for the calendar year 2002. And so on and so on and so on. One count, three chair. Whatever, yeah. Okay, count four. Same deal. Okay, there it is. That's it. Do I have to spend a whole hour explaining this? No, no, just five minutes. So, yeah. where is uh, Sherry Field now? Sherry, 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 I believe, is appealing and she's out until. No, I, I think she's been given a couple of months before sentencing. She really ought to go back on. I sent an email to her husband, and other people are telling me that they're, they're going to send mail to him. But you know, it isn't going to work for her. You know why? Because she herself must be herself in this process, and she doesn't know she's going to say the wrong things and slap herself right in the jurisdiction again. Yeah. We have just five minutes on the table. Let's suppose you're receiving the mail today. What would your procedure be? Counterclaim. Yeah, but what would you do specifically? I'd sue them. I'd put the counterclaim together and sue them. Serve them with the counterclaim. Look, a counterclaim is no different than an ordinary lawsuit. It has all the same things. The real difference is the name. Okay? It's called a... Yeah, it's counterclaim instead of claim. It changed the title, okay? And they, they are now counter-defendants and you're counter-plaintiff. But that's the important thing, you're the plaintiff. And then you, you establish your sovereignty in your paperwork. I'll show you that in a few minutes how you do that. But you establish your sovereignty and now that you're in your sovereign capacity and it's your court and you decreed what the law is, and remember, they're servants. There is nothing in the Constitution nor can there be anything in the statutes, because the statutes must conform to the Constitution. There is nothing there that authorizes them to take command of a sovereign. You understand that? Yeah. And I believe what you said is when you do your counterclaim and file it with the district court, that they're only giving them jurisdiction sufficient to rule that they have no jurisdiction and nothing further, correct? 
Well, uh, they can, uh, let's put it this way. Uh, I don't like saying giving them jurisdiction, <laughs> but anybody in all, involved in anything can always back off and say, I'm not going to do it anymore, mm -hmm. you know, if that's what they want to do. Are you sure that you all see this? I mean, this is really important to, to get this picture. I would like to hear you say a few words about what you're going to put in the body of the counterclaim. I'll follow my discourse. We're going to do that in a few minutes. Well, I, I've allocated one hour to talk about everything on this and two hours about the counterclaim. So we've been on schedule despite appearances that we've been wasting time here and there and slippage and so forth. I, I took. Good. Yeah, well, there you go. <laughs> I bet you were, weren't you? <laughs> Anyhow, see, I, 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 I'm, I'm really intent on this. I want you to really, truly, in your gut, see that they decreed the law, and that is the law at the moment of the, of the case. Yeah. If you file the counterclaim, then you have to wait? Well, yeah, anytime you... Anytime you fire a, uh, file a counterclaim, they have 30 days to answer. But when you file the counterclaim, the counterclaim is based on jurisdiction. So nothing can happen until the issue of jurisdiction is resolved. When you challenge jurisdiction, everything must stop. Now, that doesn't mean they stop. They'll try to push forward, okay? And then you have to go through enforcement procedures to stop them, like a motion to, to, to uh, uh, stop them of some kind, okay? Yeah, it's a cease, a motion to cease, or whatever. Uh, uh, a, actually, a motion for prohibition, okay? To prohibit them from proceeding. Or to stay, a stay motion. There you go, that's the word. Okay. You, Do you have to go to the court again, or they send you mail? Of course you go through the court. Of course you file in the court. You can file by mail, but you know, you, you file in the court, sure. But that's the counterclaim. I want, I, I want to focus on this. If there's any doubt about any aspect of this, what I'm telling you, raise it now, because I'm going to assume you all got it when we get to the next step. Okay? And by the way, I've been coming to Hometown Buffet a lot of times, and this lady is one of the nicest ladies here. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Do I need the microphone to ask a question? Always. Okay. So bring her a microphone, somebody, please. Um, yeah, hang on, sorry, sir. Getting in the microphone. Yeah, well, it looks like you got enough. Sure. There you go. If you don't stand on it, that is. I just raise it up higher. All right. Talk straight into it. Talk I want to make sure that we touch upon the fact that the IRS, as of March 27, 2000. Seven has been under estoppel. Uh, has been what? They have been estopped. Okay. According to the law, it is now four and a half years and since they have ignored the uh, subpoena by Mr. O'Neill, and so therefore they are now estopped, so they are out of business. Okay, now who's funding them? to still continue doing their business. And well, how are we letting them get away with it? Well, uh, first of all... Could you state the question, Bill? That yeah. Thing. Well, th apparently there was a court action in which resulted in some sort of a stopple order oh. on the IRS. Now, she's saying, who's funding them and keeping them going? How come they keep going? Well, the answer is simple. Nobody's, nobody's enforcing it. That's all. Mm -hmm. They chose to ignore it, they move on, and nobody enforces it, so there you are. What, what should happen is whoever got that order should then bring them in for contempt of court. And then the court can use its contempt powers then to put everybody in jail if necessary to get that order obeyed. But that's a separate issue. If nobody complains about an order being disobeyed, it's as good as obeyed as far as the court's concerned. You've got to bring things before the court. Remember this. When you, when you want something from the court, you always do it with a motion. The first motion that you make is not called a motion. The, the first motion you make to a court has a special name. It's called a complaint. 
But it is a motion just like anything else, okay? Yeah, you were saying? What? Your mic. Your mic is on. My mic is on? It's on. Yeah, it's on. Well, it was on all the time I was talking. No, was well, then there's a broken wire or something. No, no, it's big. Over there. It's big. Where the waitress walked. Yeah. It's clear. It's okay now. It's okay now. Problem solved. Okay, I didn't know that. Wasn't aware. I didn't do anything to solve it. No. <clears throat> What's making the noise? Focus. Okay. All right. Anyhow, um, the um, yeah, you basically you make a request of the court, and you you provide all the supporting evidence, and then uh, uh, and then the other person gets a chance to answer, and then you get to reply to the answer, and then they get to uh, reply to the reply. And it goes back and forth under common law. Under, under the present equity system, there's only three papers. You make the initial paper, and then there's the answer, and then there's a reply to the answer. You're not allowed to bring up new issues in the reply to the answer. The purpose of the reply is to reply to the new issues brought up by them. See, they answer your accusations, but then they can bring up something. So then you have to have an opportunity to, to reply to that, and then that's where they cut off normally. So, uh, but that is, they keep saying, show me the law. There it is. That is the law, the decree of the sovereign. And they are sovereign until somebody comes along and says, no, you're not. <laughs> but you have to do it the right way, and defending is not good enough because defending See, the, def the, the plaintiff is the sovereign. The defendant is the subject of the sovereign. So you've got to flip that relationship. And you do it with a counterclaim. The counterclaim comes back and says, hey, wait a minute. I'm the sovereign here, and you guys are doing this wrong. <clears throat> and when you challenge jurisdiction, that's the point. When you're challenging jurisdiction, Everything stops because they have to prove to your court that they do have jurisdiction. Could that be rephrased to say that they're giving a presentment, and unless you counter that presentment, it stands? Well, yeah, you can put it in commercial terms if you want. I mean, it's pretty much uh, the world operates by the same formula, regardless of how you label it. You know, it always starts off with somebody presenting something accusation or request or whatever, and then the other person comes back and says yay or nay, and then the other one comes back another time. You know, it, that's the pattern of life. Okay, and in this case they're giving a presentment, and when you counter it in court without doing a counterclaim, they just overrule you and go on. Where right, yeah, because see, you're not, you're not saying that they injured you, you're saying I haven't injured him. Oh. Well, so the question centers around the complainer. So you've got to come back and, you see, normally the, normally the uh, defendant, by custom of what we say, okay, what we say isn't necessarily what we do, but by custom of what we say, the defendant is innocent until proven guilty. But that's not how it works, really. No. You're guilty until proven innocent. You're condemned the, Sure. And the proof of that is if you don't answer, you default and you are guilty. See, that, that's how it works. Now, that doesn't work that way in criminal proceedings. See, no. criminal proceedings, if you don't answer, they have to find you, catch you, and bring you in before they can default you. And, and it's not a default. They, they have to go through the paces. Right. So they, in, in the civil type thing or in the common law situation, the accusation is made, and then there's the default or the presumption, and then you have, the only way you can get around this is you have to say, wait a minute, where is your jurisdiction? In all proceedings, normally, if you make an accusation, you have to also provide the evidence. When you challenge jurisdiction, that's, that is the one exception to the rule. When you challenge jurisdiction, all you have to say is, what jurisdiction? And the burden is on the defendant to prove that he had jurisdiction in his case. Mm -hmm. 
That's the one case where the burden of proof falls on the accuser, I mean on the defendant, actually counter defendant, okay? So he cannot proceed until he proves jurisdiction. Now, if you don't question jurisdiction, he automatically has it. Yep. There's another rule. If you fail to object, it means you agree. That's universal among all courts. Okay? You have to object. And you object with a counterclaim or you object by other methods. But if you don't do any objection, that means you agree. <coughs> so here we are, Sherry Jackson again. They made the ac accusation. She never objected to the law. What she said, I'm guessing, is where is the law? Show me the law. They did. And they did. Only she didn't know it. And her attorney didn't know it. Mm -hmm. See? You think the attorney really didn't know it? I'm sure he didn't know it. I'm sure. These, these guys are not that bright, okay? Mm -hmm. I mean, they're intelligent, yes. But they're not that well educated. I mean, this is a whole completely different view based on sovereignty and such. They don't get that kind of training in law school. Okay? Are we down? Are you running? Okay. So, see, they don't get that kind of training in law school. So, he looks at it. Oh, all right, this is the accusation. So, we do the standard defense. And then they get convicted, and everybody wonders why. Look at uh, Erwin Schiff. Okay, Erwin Schiff, same deal. He got, I guess, indicted. In his case, I think he got indicted. But nevertheless, now I talked to Erwin Schiff, and uh, I could just tell, just by the way he reacted, that he wasn't really seeing it, what I was saying to him. Of course, I only had a few seconds, really, to talk to him, because somebody else had convinced him to call me, okay? And so we eventually got together in a discussion, and we talked for, I guess, a half hour, something like that, a good, good length of time. What year, what year was this, Bill? Uh, it was about a year before he got convicted. Okay, was that when? I don't know when he got convicted. 80s or something? Or no, 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 just... October 2006 was the conviction. October 2006 was the conviction, so it must have been a couple years before that or something, or a year, I don't know. Yeah. I didn't, I'm not tracking it. Okay. But the point is, is that just before he went through all that, well, maybe a year before he actually got convicted, uh, I tried to tell him this stuff. And I tried to bring it to his attention about uh, 26 U.S.C. 7806, which says the rest is not law. He didn't buy any of it. And then he, he, just before he hung up, he said, well, I'll call you later. I, I'll get back to you on this. And I said, I don't think you will. He says, oh, yeah. He says, I'll get back to you. But I could just tell by the way he's receiving it. I was just simply on Mars, you know? Somebody coming in and saying that you can dump the judge and that type of thing, it's just, you know? But you can see here, I've got, I've got the cases that back up what I'm saying, the, the, the constitutional statements, and of course there's some interpretation, and then Presumably, you're looking at exactly what I'm looking at, and presumably, you can come to the same conclusions I do based on those same things. But it was just too far out for him, and he stayed with the standard route of, of defending, but the problem is, is that the government was absolutely out to get him. And so that judge did everything within his power to stop the appropriate evidence from getting to the jury, okay? And so, there you are. Yeah. Did you look at the Larkin Rose case at all? No, but I got. I've been. Uh, you see, Larkin Rose doesn't answer my emails. You know, I've written to him. Eventually, I did get to him, and he. We did have some communication, but we went nowhere with it. See, Larkin Rose is a guru. A guru. Uh, that's, that's okay. I mean, and my experience has been that everybody who truly really in-depth knows their subject. And, and Larkin Rose does know his subject. I don't take that away from him. They can't switch to a different philosophy. See, it's not, it's not that they don't know or do know or don't know. 
It's a question of a system of thought. And this thing totally inverts the whole structure. Now, if somebody will listen to me several hours, like you have, I can lead you through the path that leads to the conclusion. And then, once you see it, well, at least I think it becomes obvious. You know, but you have to get down that path. Talking to somebody on the phone for one hour doesn't do it. See, and that's all I usually get with these guys. So uh, there's not too much hope of me of, of them seeing this without somebody really spending some quality time with them and and giving them an opportunity to challenge. And then one more thing, they have to actually listen to the answer. And and these. These people who are well versed in their subject area often are not good at listening. You know? Yeah, now look, I hope you guys pin me to the wall on this if I ever quit listening. Okay? Because, I mean, I, I, I've seen the tendency in myself too. You know, you know it so well, somebody comes off the wall with something different, obviously they're wrong. You know? A bad attitude, but it, it, it just human nature. You tend to gravitate toward it's that. Cognitive and I, dissonance. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So you see, um, hopefully, I can self-correct before you guys have to correct me. But it is a natural human tendency to, when you become expert in your field, to then, frankly, disregard anything that comes along that obviously doesn't work. Obvious in my own mind, and yet it does work. See. <laughs> But I, I, I say, I ask them a key question. Sometimes I try to offset, and rarely does it work, but sometimes it does. I'll say, all right, you go to court and you lose a case. What do you do? Who made the decision? They say, well, the judge did. All right, so how do you handle that? Well, we appeal it. Okay. I say, that's not what I do. So they say, what do you do? I say, I issue an order vacating his decision. Can you do that? <laughs> no response. Well, right, they can't do that, they don't do that, and they don't believe that I did it. Okay? So, you know, it's really tough to get through to, to people who already have <coughs> basically, <coughs> see, they've paid their dues. And I can understand somebody who's paid his dues to not exactly uh, cotton to somebody who's just new, new in their minds, new on the, in this business. But I've been doing this now for, well, I've been at this since around 1983, okay? But I didn't really get understanding until about 1990. That, that's when I started, and, and, and I didn't do it by myself. I had a tremendous amount of help from a lot of people, you know, and discussions and points of view and so forth. So it, it was a, a long road to coming to where I came on this stuff, and then hopefully, it's organized well enough so that you guys can now pick it up and at least do something with it. Let's see. It is now. Okay, Mr. Bill. Um, I, I wait long enough. You um, waited long enough. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah. I didn't see it there. That's okay. I was so engrossed in myself, That's okay. I didn't notice I'm you. I'm wearing my <laughs> green high heels, okay? I'm fine. Okay, very good. Anyway, uh, when I was inside, I remember uh, Michael Jackson uh, uh, case. And he paid twenty million on that four words. Uh, intentionally no. Intentionally inflicted emotional distress. Okay? That's very a powerful market. It is. It happened to all of us. We need to be inflicted and be alter ego inflicted by it. That way when we get so pissed off, we react. And that's where they hold our ass in jail. That's what it is. So I wanna go back to the word offense. When I look at my charge, I said, oh, friends and felony, how can you judge me and condemn me at the same time in a row? I said, what, duh? How do you get all this? So I'm asking myself. Then, now you talk about this, so the root of the problem is they have to offense you first, then they could alter your ego, and then when they alter your ego, you practically inflicted, you know, they inflict you, uh, by doing that, then instead of saying, wait a minute, I'm not part of this, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, you guys want to play a game, eh? Go your way. It's like 
they have to offend you. Then that way their market will be awesome and blossomed like, you know, the market is jail. So I was talking to Richard here. So now I come to my conclusion that our country is really poor because they have to make a capital out of us. When yeah, I was inside, when I was inside the jail, yeah. I have a small dictionary because I don't have a dictionary there like I have. Mm -hmm. The capital, the, the charge means capital. And so wait a minute, just like the credit card. So they're using me as a credit card to make them a credit out of me. So I look on my mathematic brain and say, wait a minute, if they charging me this moi, so they use that as more as a capital so they could make business out of me as a Okay, whoa. but that's a whole different area well, than what this seminar is about. Well, they're taking you guys yeah. anywhere. You I know, we've, we've heard a lot about, about the fact that when somebody is taken into custody that they become an asset of some kind uh, where people can somehow the bonding process and so forth. But our purpose here in the seminar is to show you an, what the law is and how to deal with it. So uh, this is really critical. If anybody has any doubts about the fact the law was decreed at this point and how it was decreed, say it now because that, this is critical to the next step that I want to go to. I'd like to confirm what you're saying specifically and give maybe a slight shift in thinking to understand it better. Mm -hmm. Ego is what's involved here. We have experts that understand what the problem is and want to have their case in court, right? Mm -hmm. They want to present it to the jury, mm -hmm. get it shown, prove their case, and set precedent mm -hmm. every time. And then the they get burned. The keeps it from the jury. Yeah. It Absolutely. It never gets to the jury. It and can't. rightfully so. So your approach of step, nipping it in the bud, mm -hmm. stopping it with jurisdiction, with a counterclaim, mm -hmm. is the only way. Yeah. Well, that's that's what I'm convinced of. <laughs> well, you're not in jail right now, so right. Not right now. Not right now. Yeah. Not right now. Mm -hmm. Give me time. <laughs> yeah. And neither is Linda Wall of Preferred Services, because she did his approach. She didn't. I don't know if she did a counterclaim or not. But again, she questioned jurisdiction, jurisdiction, right. jurisdiction. They dismissed. It's easier. It's easier to to do that dismissal with a counterclaim than it is because you're putting their paychecks at risk. Yeah. And one thing too, Mr. Bell, uh, doesn't mean if you have to go to a building in the court, how to be in court. When you're riding your car and you're in the street and the cop pull you, you're right there in court with them. Yeah, right from the get-go right you're in court. Right from the get-go. They're, they're acting yeah. as a judge the whole night, the whole shebang. You, you, anytime you have any interaction with these people, Never forget that you're always in court, right from the beginning. The moment he, that cop opens his mouth and says anything that's against your interest, you're in his court. Okay? And yeah, so you, right from the get-go, it's what's your authority. You know, you may still get arrested, but it's what's your authority. That's right. You can be nice about it. You can be non-challenging in the sense you say, I don't understand what your authority is. You know, you can be nice, but... Don't ever let that point get away. I, I had one that worked. <coughs> a cop pulled me over for crack mm -hmm. windshield and expired registration. First thing I asked him was, where was the emergency? Was there a life-threatening situation? He said, no. Why? I said, but you turned on your lights. They're only supposed to be legally used for a life-threatening situation. You didn't violate the law, did you? Yeah, there you go. That's a cute one. He said, well, tell you what. Fix your windshield and do your registration. I'm going to go. <laughs> Very good. Yeah. Well, I think, yeah, I haven't dug into that issue myself, but my understanding is, is that they can only pull you over for probable cause, and probable cause means the committing of an arrestable offense. Yeah. And Say, not only a that, real crime, not, not a, an infraction. Yeah, not only but, that, when you're out there, there's two type of law. They call them de jure and de facto. De uh -huh. jure is the one that took the old printing in the whole nine yard. And then he will hire another one that hired by by him, which is the de jure, which is the, those policemen, but they call them the de facto. So those are not, they don't take no out. Okay, what we're gonna do then is we'll jump to the next step, which is the remedy. How do you deal with this? 
Well, in a word, it's a counterclaim. Okay? That's all. Counterclaim. And you challenge the jurisdiction. What is your jurisdiction? Let me show you. Um, uh, I can show you a format on the counterclaim so you can see it. Now, the thing is, is that different courts have different formats. Uh, if you're in California or if you're in the Ninth, uh, ninth uh, well, maybe not. I won't say the Ninth Circuit, but <laughs> it, at least in California, there's a very definite statewide format, which is controlled by the rules. But you can, you will find in other states they have other formats. So what I'm saying here, the format may be different, but the but the the elements are the same. You still have to say who the plaintiff is, who the defendant is, but where you put those things on the where you type them on the page varies from one jurisdiction to a next. But let's see, let's go back to um, we'll get out of this this one. Mm -hmm. Did you ever hear from Sherry's husband? Never. That's okay. I did my part. You know, I, 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 I'm a strong believer in the concept that I am no more interested in a person case than he is. It saves me a lot of work. <laughs> okay, let's see. Um, I guess we're back. Are you familiar with the, the case of Bernice Cumberland, the Federal Express pilot? No. Oh, the, I've heard of uh, the pilot, yes. I don't, didn't know the name, but I'm not familiar with the case, no. But I'm sure it runs along the same lines. Yeah, I mean, sure every, every person I've talked to, I mean, I, I, I know about Al Thompson. I know about uh, Sim Cannon. There's another guy, Jerry, something or other, who was out toward uh, Redondo Beach somewhere in that area. And um, and Irwin Schiff, you know, and they, all these guys, they, they they defend. You can't defend in deals like this. I mean, it's a slam dunk pretty much to get you. Once in a while, one of them gets through the system, like you know that attorney. What's his Bob name? Cryer. Yeah, Cryer. Tommy Cryer was very. He, he got. He, I won't say he got lucky. I'm sure he he did his research and he was very effective. But it was a fight right down to the end. With this approach, the fight pretty quickly comes to an end because you're out. You're suddenly you're issuing orders. You know, <laughs> that's a lot nicer position to be in. Uh, let's let's go to uh, so Bill, Cryer, yeah. Prior had B. Kraft, who is a yeah. Theory attorney. Yeah. Well, I remember B. Kraft. I have it on my website. I have a challenge to Larry B. Kraft. Yeah. Yeah. He. This guy. He. Um, uh, I don't know if I, I don't remember if I put the details in there, but Beecraft was invited to uh, 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 a seminar, and there were five people selected to to speak at the seminar. And the person who sponsored this seminar, this is back in the, I guess the late '80s or something like that. I can't remember. It was the first time that that time that. Before B. Kraft went, or before Bill Benson went to jail, um, <clears throat> this guy spent five thousand dollars for the airfare and hotel costs and everything for the speakers, as well as B. Kraft, as well as Benson, to bring this information together. The concept was is that B. Kraft had the training, the general training that an attorney always has. And these people had specialized knowledge in their areas, and that by bringing this in, maybe the attorney would pick up things and incorporate them to help his client. That was the theory. So I was speaker number five in that group. And uh, um, up until I spoke, the various people had their points of view. They were mostly statutory in how they did things. I'm the only guy who who believes in writing his own laws. <laughs> and he, anyway, they, they had these groups and, and B. Kraft sat there very patiently listening. When I started talking about sovereignty, I was fine with B. Kraft and still I, until I brought up sovereignty. Sovereignty is what gets you out of their jurisdiction. See? He about blew a cork. 
I mean, he was yelling at me. He was calling me names. And then finally he stormed out of there and took, took uh, Bill Benson in tow with him. We weren't even finished. We were still going to do the next day. <laughs> this was just the first day of the weekend, Saturday. Okay? He took him out of there. And then the next day, somebody contacted him. He didn't come back. He said, well, he had to see some other people while he was there. This guy's paid all the expenses. I mean, he didn't bring Beecraft over to, to see these other people. He brought him here for a specific, which Beecraft agreed to. But Beecraft didn't want anything to do it. When we hit that, so that sovereignty was a real sensitive issue with him. And, and remember, Beecraft's the guy who wrote the book on sovereignty. I don't know if you're aware of that. Yeah, he wrote a, Beecraft wrote a book about sovereignty. Okay? So, I have to question myself. I, I say, well, where's this guy coming from? <laughs> you know? jealous that you knew. No, I think it's more that we, we bumped up against an agenda that he may have. That's, mm -hmm. But that's just my theory. Okay? The point is, and then, so I wait a few years and he forgets. And I suck him into a conversation. <laughs> <laughs> I've done that twice to him. He forgets over the long range, <laughs> okay, over years. My dad used to tell me something that I've been considering adopting for myself. He used to tell me that when the elephants forget, they come and ask me. <laughs> but anyhow, um, be that as it may, may be, um, I have fun with Beecraft, and, and I get very blunt with him. I, I let him know that it's okay for him to go crawl under a rock somewhere. You know. <laughs> he doesn't want to discuss it civilly. One time he came back and he tried to pull this, uh, he was uh, more accustomed to the uh, genteel civility of the South. That was before he knew that I was the guy that he had so ungenteelly treated. <laughs> And then I relate the history to him, and I say, well, we already know who you are. <laughs> anyway, I, I have fun with him. I mean, he, obviously, I'm not going to convince him of anything. But then I put the emails up and let the public judge for themselves. That's my best way of dealing with these guys. And so every time I meet a guru, guru who is, you know, the great leader or whatever, I bring him into conversation, and then I ask him questions, and I let them deteriorate, you know. They <laughs> Self-destruct. Yeah, they self-destruct. I mean, they actually got down to telling me that they always say that I'm wrong, but I have yet to have any of them say why I'm wrong, to actually objectively say this is wrong because of this, 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 or whatever. Don't get that. I'm just wrong. So to me, that's the acid test. I think I may be on the right track. You know? Well, you're still here with us. You're still <laughs> I'm still what? Alkaline. Alkaline, okay. <laughs> I see. All right, very good. Well, all right, we got to get to the to this uh, counterclaim. Uh, let's see if I can uh, find it. Uh, first of all, I want you to show you how to structure the lawsuit itself. Let me explain something about the term lawsuit, okay? Now, I've been talking about lawsuit all along, but I want to tell you right now that legally speaking, I'm using the wrong word, okay? What it really is is that you have actions at law and you have suits in equity, okay? Or equity suits. When you talk about a suit, that's equity. When you talk about an action at law, that's law. Okay, then along around the beginning of the last uh, of the prior century, they came up with this great fantastic idea. They said, "Let's put them together." There's only one form of action. You ever seen that? Mm -hmm. You've seen that in your studies, right? One form of action. So they have law and equity combined. They're no longer wanting to distinguish it. The problem is they have to distinguish it because the Constitution has not changed. Yeah, that's a constitutional factor. Law is different from equity. So until they change the Constitution, they can't really se can't separate, I mean, cannot combine them. But nevertheless, they, they put the procedures together 
And if you look carefully, you will see that some of the court rules conflict with other court rules. And the reason is, is because the one set of court rules is law and the other set is equity. It's two different systems, but they don't identify them as such. I think, I'm not sure, I think it's Rule 7A and Rule 7C of the Federal Rules of Civil Procedure. I think it's Rule 7 anyway, and I can't remember if it's A and C or B and C, but there's a conflict between the two rules. You look at it and they say, wait, wait a minute. They, one's co kind of contradicting the other. That's why. One's common law and the other is, is uh, <laughs> equity-based. Okay? So, um, when they tried to combine them together, that's when they started calling these things lawsuits. Okay? So, what we're doing... What I'm advocating here is doing actions at law. Your counterclaim it will be an action at law and not a suit. So all this time I've been using the word lawsuit, I was really technically incorrect. It's actually an action at law or just an action. But everybody says lawsuit. So <laughs> as long as you understand that, it's okay. All right, so here's how you put together a lawsuit or actually an action at law. <clears throat> this particular case is an original action. It was done very sloppily, so the plaintiff revised it, and the plaintiff put together a first amended action. So when you look at this action, the very first paragraph is normally not, not included. And it says, the first amended action amends by entire substitution the action filed October 7th, 1998 in the above entitled court. So that explains the relationship between the amended action and the original action. Normally that paragraph wouldn't be there. Normally paragraph two would be paragraph one. Okay? And here's what it says. William Jones, here and after plaintiff, is one of the people of California and in this court of record complains of and then names the defendants, okay? And it also describes the type of action here, I think, doesn't it? Uh, yeah, it says, in a plea of trespass and trespass on the case. Trespass is when somebody is injured because of violence. Where violence is involved, it's called trespass. Being punched in the eye is trespass. Trespass is not like one attorney said when I was in court, this attorney said, Your Honor, there's no real estate involved in this case. There's no trespass. She obviously didn't understand trespass. Trespass is any time... Whoa, okay. Are we running out of tape? No. Just 10 minutes to the break or something? Oh, to change the disc, okay. So trespass... Um, is where violence is involved or the threat of violence. You either sign here on this ticket or I'll take you in, arrest you. That's a trespass, okay, if he's violating your rights. The other one, four words, trespass on the case. Trespass on the case is where an injury occurs where there's no violence. For example, let's say a con artist sucked you into a, a fraudulent contract. Okay, not through threat, but just simply cheated you. Okay, you were injured. Since there was no physical violence and no threat of violence, then there is no trespass. It is now trespass on the case if you were injured. And an injury does not mean a physical injury. It can be financial injury, okay, or emotional injury. So that's the difference between the two. In this case, they sued for both, trespass and trespass on the case, because there were elements from both. Okay, yep. now, look at this. I want you to really look closely at this first line. Not the first paragraph, but the first line of the paragraph. William Jones, there he identifies himself. Here and after plaintiff, there he gives him an, himself an easy alias. Sometimes it's easier to refer to a person by his character, his nature, or something, rather than using his name. It makes it easier to read the rest of the, of the action. Okay. In one case, I had a case where uh, the police 
had uh, arrested somebody. Okay, that's what the police said. We thought it was a kidnap. Now, in your actions, whenever you do an action, you never put in your conclusions unless you say that you are concluding. But you never say that the person was kidnapped because maybe it wasn't. That's a, that's a judicial determination, was he kidnapped or not. But you're suing because you were carried away without your permission. Okay? See the difference? However, what we did in the suit or in the action, now that you know, I gotta say it right. What we did in the action, we said, uh, uh, Mr. Jones, Mr. John Jones, here and after kidnapper. <laughs> now he had an alias. We didn't say he was a kidnapper, we're just saying this is his new name that we're gonna use through the rest of the complaint. <laughs> so you can do stuff like that. Uh, if you, you think about it, and if you can generalize your thinking, a lot of times you can transfer concepts from one area to another with your generalization. One time we had, a, um, we had an attorney. <clears throat> Boy, she was a dirty mouth. I mean, really dirty mouth. And this guy calls, calls her up, the defendant, because she was suing. He calls her up, and he says something, and she says, Horseshit. And he says something else. And she says, horseshit. That was her actual language. And so then, after saying this maybe two or three more times, he said something else and she said, that's a bunch of horseshit. Okay? And the guy was trying to be reasonable or whatever and, you know, on target. So, and this called for some reaction that would show up in court. So when he wrote his report to the court on the conversation he had with her, he put down exactly what she said, every word of it, okay? And he, and he wrote it in such a way, it took exactly one page for this particular area. It was a multi-page thing, but this one thing, he, he made it all fit on one page, intentionally so. Mm -hmm. And he reported the conversation, going down the page, every dirty word she said, all the way down. And then finally, in the last sentence, he said, it is the opinion of this writer that, that the attorney, Mrs. So-and-so, was suffering from a severe case of vowel motion. <laughs> I don't know what the judge thought of that, but we had fun with that one. <laughs> yeah, well, you know, legal writing does not have to be all that dry, okay? You can, you can see things and you can, you see, when you're, and, and this is all under a penalty of perjury, right? He's, he's writing an affidavit on this report. And, you know, in an affidavit, you can always tell the truth, okay? Come right out with it. There's, there's no restrictions. There's no such thing as pornography in, in an affidavit. If that's what happened, that's what you say. You know, you report it. And so uh, that's what this guy did. Yeah, it was graphic. And, uh, but y you can have fun with these things. When, they, when these people do these stupid things and come out, you can recast them as to what it really is. And, and it's fun. Don't worry about being all this legalistic. You can use plain English, actually. You can shift over into business English if it suits the, the cause. <laughs> Anyhow, so much for that. So the first thing, the person defined himself, and then he gave himself an alias. And he said, he is one of the people of California. Bam, right there, he's sovereign. See? People are sovereign. The people do not yield their sovereignty to the agencies which serve them. So when he said he was a people, and by the way, the word people is both singular and plural, he said he was a people. But he said he was one of the people. But nevertheless, he's a people. And that means he's sovereign automatically. You do not have to say you're sovereign. If you say you're sovereign, that's not a good court showing. You remember, what's the purpose? What's the court? Keep that in mind. Stage. The purpose of the court. It's a stage on which you put a show. So you never say you're sovereign because that puts, gives you the image of Napoleon with his hand stuck in his shirt. 
All right? So you don't want that. But if you say you're one of the people, well, everybody knows that. Yeah. So I guess it would be superfluous to say you're sovereign. Yeah. Go ahead. So you infer it. I guess it would be superfluous to say you're sovereign because it's assumed that your people are already controlled. That's correct. However, we do not leave anything to guessing, okay? So we want to make it clear that the people are sovereign. So elsewhere in the paper, we put in our statement about the people are sovereign. Or they don't, we quote, the people do not yield their, their sovereignty to the agency we serve them. So we never put the word sovereignty next to our name. Always keep it one removed. That gives you, well, that keeps them from making fun of you or laughing at you. See? How about sui juris? I stay away from technical terms like that, <laughs> okay? I mean, you can say it if you want to, if it calls for it, but I try to make my papers look just like what an attorney would write, except for certain critical things. And this is one of the critical things. So I say, I'm one of the people of the jurisdiction, one of the people of California, one of the people of New York, one of the people of the United States, whatever it is that you're saying, okay? So, by the way, I, one of the things I have to do is take a body count, how many people were here. And I think one of them just left permanently. Yeah, two that left. Uh, yeah, two that left. So I need to count how many are here. One, two, three, four, no, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen, sixteen. So there's 16 now and two just left. That makes 18. So there were 20 here. Yeah. Yeah, and they left early. So, so we have 20 here. Count again. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8. No, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7. 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15. I'm 16. There's 17 there. And then the, and then the two guys that left, they're 18. 19. 19. And 19. And then the, and Ted just left. No, Ted just came back. He's number 20. Is there anybody else outside? That's on here, Mr. Bill. There's somebody else out there that's in our group? Yeah, that's, oh, I counted him already. So it's 20, right? Because I gotta, I gotta pay the the place here for that. Oh, okay, twenty. Mm -hmm. So, all right, I gotta pay for the food. Every head I count, I have to pay for three meals. Okay. Mr. Bill, mm -hmm. that's in here. Yes, yes, that's on on the on the disc. Okay. Continuing on this one line. This is a long line. It just looks short. Okay. <laughs> All right, so he's one of the people of California. That establishes his sovereignty. Not instantly, but it's there. Legally, it's there. Visually, it's not that obvious. Okay, and in this court of record complains of. Now, court of record, automatically, common law, no statutes. Mm -hmm. Automatically, the judge is suspended. You don't have to say he's suspended. He is suspended. Okay? He cannot do anything of a judicial nature. He can only administrate direct traffic. All right? Help in deciding who gets to talk next. <laughs> that's it. Uh, so that's everything there. Absolutely everything. Sovereignty, common law, who's in charge, you're the boss, you're the plaintiff, it's your court, you've selected the forum. Everything is said in that, those few short words. The beauty of it is, it's never, I have not, in all this time, and all the people that I've talked to, never has anyone ever challenged that sentence. Wow. Never. What's the first rule? Well, not the first rule, but you remember the rule? If you fail to object, it means you agree. So they agree to the sovereignty, they agree to the common law, they agree that the judge is not, not able to make any decisions. Now, let's suppose the impossible happened. I say it's impossible because it never has happened, okay? But let's say that the impossible happened. Let's say that somebody did challenge it. Right. Not going to do them any good. 
because these are cast in concrete principles. Okay? There is no questioning whether or not the people are sovereign relative to the state. They created the Constitution. It says so right in the preamble. See, that preamble sets the whole stage for the, the Constitution. You ask any attorney, what's the significance of the preamble? He will tell you it has no significance. It's just an introductory phrase that, that you know, it, basically it's good writing. It's nice writing. Now, he is right only for one reason is he right, and that's because he operates inside the Constitution. See? He's operating inside that system. But I'm an outsider. And because I'm an outsider, I look at more than just the basic Constitution. I look at the preamble, too. Yes, sir? Bill, this question goes to the heart of uh, your contention that mm -hmm. we can go back and forth with uh, either being one of the people, a sovereign person, sure. or, or become a citizen. And it's right. by virtue of uh, what, if we're, what if we're attacked on the fact that we have a social security number or a driver's license. Fine. Well, what do, we, what do we say? How do we say it? Well, you know, where, where, where does it say in your social security contract that you have to pay taxes? I'll See, it's now, a, it, I acknowledge that. Well, that's the limitation on the contract. Okay. All right. But I don't, I mean, yeah. You, you do admit, though, that there are people in, in this movement, the tax denier mm -hmm. movement, whatever you mm -hmm. want to call it, who will say that we're, we're, we really can't do anything until we uh, oh, yeah. uh, throw away our, our, our rights as a citizen, uh, uh, formally declare that we're not citizens of the United States. We have to get rid of our social security number, get rid of our driver's license, right? And yeah, I know all that, okay. but all you have so you to... Don't buy it. You, you, you would argue not that. only do I not buy it, but on your left is somebody who put it to the test. She had 461 days in jail, never entered a plea, okay? They couldn't get by the jurisdiction issue that she raised. They had her social security number on there, they had her driver's license number on there, and she went in forma pauperis, which people are out there also saying that if you claim in forma pauperis, that automatically makes you subject to the government. There are people who have said that too. I've heard that argument. What was the last point? In forma pauperis. What does that mean? That means you're so poor you can't pay the filing fees. Okay? You're a pauper. She was everything, and they still didn't get by. Never raised the issue. Okay, and her, the first sentence, the first line in her suit was exactly what you see here. She said she's one of the people of California. She said, she, you know, this, in this court of record, she's complaining of so-and-so. Those issues never came up. And she issued her court orders. They never once brought prosecution against her for the, you know, in the, in the penal code, there is a code that says anybody who puts in a phony paper or a paper purporting to be a court paper that isn't, that's, that's a crime, okay? Not once did they ever come against her. They didn't even raise that issue, okay? I know it's hard to believe you have this much authority in your hands, but you do. It's, it, it took me a while. Look, the very first time that I went into court, my knees were knocking. I was, I was operating on pure 100% logic. I had no prior experience. I had no, when I say experience, no prior experience with this, this kind of thing. I had I, uh, no examples. Nobody could tell me anything, okay? Uh, one of the best people around who should have been able to tell me was Roger Elvick. He couldn't tell me anything along those lines, okay? So I went on pure raw logic I said, if this is so, if I'm sovereign, if this is my court, so to speak, and so forth, I should be able to do this. And what this particular case was, was it wasn't my case at all. This guy was in jail on an interstate misdemeanor warrant. Now, interstate warrants are only felonies, but they hated this guy so bad, they, they made it interstate even though it was a misdemeanor. And you know what he did? He had a dispute with his wife. 
His wife picked up the kids, left California, went to Nevada. He went to Nevada and saw an attorney. The attorney said, well, there's no court action. You just pick up your kids and take them back. So that's what he did. He went and he picked up his kids on advice of his attorney. They called that kidnapping and they put out a misdemeanor charge against him to prosecute him, okay? So that's what they were after him for. So he's in jail being held because they picked him up on the warrant, okay? So then that's when he and I met each other. Apparently he got his, my name from somewhere and he had some issues that I wanted to test. I don't get involved in cases normally unless I got an issue I want to test, see? And he had a perfect case for me. So I went up there, I talked to him. He appointed me as a special master in his court. Now twice before he had moved for habeas corpus with an informal request from inside the jail, which is okay. And twice the Superior Court judges rubber stamped the denial on, on him being held by the Municipal Court. That's when he asked me to be involved. So I went in, I started researching it. After we settled it, he, get, he signed a paper appointing me as a special master in his court, assigning me by his sovereign authority the duties to hold hearings, to investigate, and to whatever it takes in order to gather the information. And, and so I began to do that. Well, then on, on uh, somewhere in the middle of the week, there was a jailhouse rumor that he was going to be pulled into court the following Monday. So on the following Monday, oh, by the way, I filed the special master assignment with the clerk. And I met the chief clerk. I said to the chief clerk, I said, and I was dressed just like an attorney, suit, tie, I had a vest had no beard, okay? I looked like, very much like an attorney. And I said to, the, I said to this person, I said, the reason I'm, I wanted to talk to you is that I want you to know that you're gonna see some very unusual paperwork come through. But I don't want you to think I'm a kook, <laughs> you know? But this is extremely unusual. We're invoking laws that you, won't, you don't see every day. And so she, and, and I was very presentable and, and calm and, you know, and so she accepted me personally. Well, the day came when I filed these papers, had no problem, they were greased right in. And so I filed this appointment for a special master. So then I went down to the court on that Monday morning and I requested to see the judge in chambers because I got there early, okay? And so he saw me. And we sat down and I said to him, I said, the reason that I'm here is that I wanted you to, I didn't want you to be surprised in the courtroom. I wanted you to know what was coming down the pike. And I said, I've been appointed as a special master in the Superior Court and I'm here to observe this case and I just wanted you to know what I was doing there. And he said, well, thank you. He appreciated that, okay? And I was very lucky. I met a judge who basically had integrity and intelligence. I don't know, God must have been on my side or something. Whatever the, the influence was, uh, it, it was perfect for our first time. And uh, so and while I was talking to him, and another, a, an attorney walked in, just came into the office, apparently he was accustomed to it, and he started talking to the judge. And lo and behold, he's going to talk to the judge about this very same case. And he, he looked at me, he thought I was an attorney, he wasn't worried, you know. <laughs> <laughs> well, the judge was no dummy. <laughs> he, he could see that this is highly illegal, what this guy was doing. In my case, I was a representative of the Superior Court. In this guy's case, he was a representative of one of the parties trying to talk to the attorney without the other party present. Big difference, legally. So he, the judge said, wait a wait a minute. He says, this is getting too complicated. We need to go, go on the record. <laughs> and that's how he cut off this, this attorney. So we all exited. When it came my turn to talk, I stood up, I was right standing, I had the, the public defender on the right who had been assigned to the case, I had the prosecutor on my left who was a different person than the person that walked in, and uh, is a lady, and so I introduced myself, I said I'm so and so, I said I've been appointed as a special master in the Superior Court of California, and I said uh, uh, I'm here to observe the proceedings in this particular matter. And I said, I am here and now declaring 
the, the Superior Court of the State of California opened and in session. So here we were, one courtroom and two courts. Okay? Did you have a quick question? Uh, yes, Bill. Um, there on your pleading, uh, where it says, in this court of record, how do we know that the judge himself is going to understand what that means? We don't care. We don't care. Right. Anything he does, he'll get the explanation as to why he's wrong later. Right, right now, we just put in the minimum. We're not raising issues. We let them raise the issues. So when he issues a, an unlawful order because he's not authorized, that's when we say, here's why you can't issue that order, and we vacate it. By then, it's too late because he should have objected in the beginning. If you don't object, you must have agreed. Remember that principle? Yes. That's why we suck him in this way. And who objects to such a benign sentence? I'm one of the people, and in this court of record, well, everybody knows it's a court of record, right? Unfortunately, court of record has four requirements, not the two that the attorney sees in his latest dictionary. <laughs> okay? So anyway, back to the story. So in this, uh, uh, I went on to say that uh, I was here to proceed. I declared the court open and in session. And so uh, the uh, judge then asked me what it was or something. We got into conversation. Now, these guys are taking the paperwork on the, on the face of it. You know, they're just doing their job. See, but I saw a case like this where well, so on. Was the IRS said the... You're on. You're on. All right, we're on. We're on. We're on. We're on. We're on. We're on. All right, so the rest of the story is that uh, he said to me, he wanted to know what it, what it was. And so I said, well, there's a, a pending habeas corpus hearing in the Superior Court, and it involves um, you know, certain uh, common law rights and issues that are, are not yet resolved. And he said, well, he says the common law has no standing in this court. And so I said, well, you're absolutely right. I, I, Your Honor, I said, I agree. However, in Miranda versus Arizona, the court said that where substantive rights are concerned, there shall be no rulemaking. And he said, yes, that's correct. He agreed. Everybody knew the Miranda case. Okay. Now, here's the, here's the funny thing in that little conversation. He's saying the common law rights are not recognized, but substantive rights are common law rights. <laughs> There's no difference. But it's all in the language you use. You see, they don't want the common law. And I understood what he was saying. So I didn't, look, I'm not there to undermine his court. I'm there for a whole different purpose, OK? So if, if he wants to recognize the substantive rights and not recognize common law rights, I'm comfortable with that. You know, We'll roll with that. So, so I, I acknowledge that. And then he acknowledged the substantive rights. And then he says to me, he says, well, what do you want from me? Now, that was a trap because I don't want anything from him. It's the court that I represent that wants him to do something or not do something. See, a little subtlety there. And so I said, and this is, this is word for word what I said. I still have it burned in my memory. I said, it is the wish. You remember sovereigns, they wish, they don't order. Okay, my wish is your command kind of thing. That's a legal concept. I said, it is the wish of the Superior Court that the Municipal Court release jurisdiction of this matter to the Superior Court until such time as the issues in the Superior Court are settled. And he said, I will do that if you will give me the order in writing. And I said, well, I came only half prepared. I said, I do have a, an order half prepared. But I said, I didn't know how things would go, so I didn't know how to finish the order. But if you will recess the case, and w when you recall the case, I will be prepared with an order for you. And he said, fine. And so he did recess it, and he moved on with the other 50 criminals that were in there. <laughs> you know, <laughs> it, was a, it was a production line operation he had gone. And, uh, and that's what I did. I, <clears throat> hand, I had. The first half was computer printed, the second half was hand printed, and I, I took it and I made copies and all that r routine. And then when he recalled the case, I then uh, presented it to him. He read it out loud, and then he ordered that it be filed into the record. Okay, And then that was really essentially the end of the proceeding. 
One thing that happened, though, during the proceeding that was really interesting. During our discussion, there was a pause, okay, kind of like a dead moment of silence where we're trying to recoup our thoughts or something. The prosecutor stood up and she said, Your Honor, who is this man? <laughs> I've never seen him before. I don't know what he's doing here. The judge sat there and stared her down. He just looked at her. He didn't say one word. She sat down and then he turned back to me and he picked up on the conversation as though she was never there. Now you know that the judges and the prosecutors are in bed with each other all the time. You know, I mean, and for him, and when he did that, I knew I had something. Because such a discourtesy, I mean, I saw it as an outright discourtesy on his part, so deviated from the normal uh, collegiality of, of, of this whole atmosphere. And I knew I had something. My knees were still shaking, by the way. But I knew I had something, and it turned out I did. Okay, So there's a long story that follows that. But that actually happened, and, and, and it worked. So that gave me the confidence to go on to further things. If I'd met a mean judge, who knows where, I could have ended up in jail as far as I knew. What year was that, Bill? Mm, gosh, that was back in the mid-'80s or late-'80s. Yeah. And then we developed the concept further. We've issued lots of orders since then. Never had a single order directly answered. Never. It played games to get around it, so forth. So uh, for uh, one time, um, this guy had a default. So the judge removed the default by order, and then he, and he ordered a uh, pretrial hearing. And so we, what we did is we issued an order reinstating the default and removing the hearing from the calendar. Okay, this was signed by the sovereign plaintiff. All right. And we also included in that order that the judge was not to put, not to enter any more orders into this case. A direct order to the judge. And we served the judge with a copy of it. So about a month went by. And I got this desperate call from the plaintiff. He says, I don't know what to do. I said, to do about what? He says, there's a pretrial hearing in two days. I said, no. We this is a different date anyway, but we took the pretrials off calendar. He says, he says, no, he says, we've got a pretrial hearing and I don't know what to do. So I said, well, how did this happen? <laughs> you know, we issued our orders. Well, it turned out that the judge created a new order. He then put a cover letter on the order and he mailed the cover letter and the order to the plaintiff. And in the cover letter, he instructed the plaintiff to take this order and file it with the clerk, which he did. So the order, which we had ordered the, clerk, the, the judge never to file in, did not get filed in by the judge. It got filed in by sovereign authority. Do you see what happened? You, you missed that workaround. The judge was ordered never to file another order into the case. So what the judge did was he created an order. We never told him not to create an order. He then mailed the order with the cover letter instructing the plaintiff to take it and file it himself as the sovereign of the court. Right? So he filed it in, so we're back on <laughs> for a new pretrial hearing. Well. We took care of that by, with a writ of error. We issued, that was a mistaken procedure. So we ordered that again off calendar. And again, we ordered the, you know, just vacated that order. <laughs> again, by sovereign authority. But this poor guy, he, he wasn't really nice guy. Hearts was in the right place and so <laughs> forth. But he himself, as a plaintiff, had not the full picture. <laughs> And he, and he just very obediently went down and filed this order in. 
And they took it in because, after all, it's the it's sovereign that's speaking, right? <laughs> so we could not convict the judge. He didn't do it. <laughs> so anyway, but it showed, it was another proof that what we were doing was on the right track. See? And, and throughout the history of what we've been doing, the judges or whoever it is, they try workarounds, but they never directly attack the orders. So I assume that means we're right. Okay, I'm trying to find something here for you guys. Um, so what should he have done? Be honest, just ignore it? Yeah, he shouldn't have filed it. Yeah, <laughs> he should have just burned it or something. Or put it in his private file. 